see it? Yes, that's good. Excellent. So, hello everybody. I'm really pleased to be speaking to you and discussing uh, this unusual topic. I would love to be in Paris, but unfortunately I'm teaching. Um, so please bear with this um, online presentation. If anything isn't clear, either technically or in my presentation, please just shout, we can deal with it. So I'm going to talk to you about towards the physics of death. The word towards is important because in fact I'm a long way towards. I am giving an unusual talk. I have almost no results to show for myself or anybody else. But I hope I'm sketching out a new way of thinking about biophysics to you, and I would love to know what your opinion on it, especially the younger people in the audience who have got your whole career in front of you. So a more prosaic way of talking about what I mean by death is this long, ugly term, dissipative self-disassembly at all length scales. And so I would explain all these words that go along. So this is a play in three acts. Act one is scene setting. Act two is the dissipative surface assembly. Then an interval for ice cream, and then uh, act three from good idea to fruitful idea. So in other words, I want to talk, turn the idea that I give to you, if it is any good, to how what do we do about it? Okay. Act one, scene one. <coughs> is, is my sound and visual still clear? Okay. Act one, scene one is about self assembly. So the, the phrase self-assembly uh, was invented by two very famous physicists turned virologists, uh, Don, uh, Don Casper and Aaron Kluck, in a paper in 1962, okay, in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium <coughs> on quantitative biology. And his paper to talk about physical principles and the construction of regular viruses. This is Casper, this is Kluck. Got a 1982 Nobel Prize when he was actually teaching me at university. It was a very exciting time for all of us. So Kluge worked, Kluge and Kluge was working on the uh, tobacco mosaic virus. This is the uh, ribbon diagram of the coat protein. Uh, this is a sort of sub metaphysicist view of it. And what Kluge worked out is in detail how the coat protein wraps up the RNA together to make the flu virus to atomic resolution. It was a tour de force. Okay, so in their paper, they said assembly for CS process of a living or living cell are different in principle from those of a factory, in that the directions for con constructing many complex biological structures are built into the constructing component. In other words, it's not an IKEA self-made flat pack. So you don't need an instruction manual. The instructions are built into the uh, the um, um, the molecules themselves. So, you know, this is a simulation from 2014 in the Journal of Molecular Biology. I can't remember which particular virus, but you can see the capsid proteins in in the pentagons. The nucleic acid is the red. <coughs> I'm not going to play it to the end, but you know what happens at the end. Eventually, the um, the uh, virus uh, self assembles into a capsid, um, and it's entirely due to Brownian motion. So I'm going to play just for just one minute or two, just to sum up the sound. Have. I'm going to need some music to go with this. In this mode, I don't know how to speed up the movie. That's very annoying. Something eventually happens here. You can see the idea. OK, so I'm, I'm really not going to play it to the end. Eventually, a perfect capsule enclosing the DNA forms. So there was assembly, if you look it up on the web of science, in viral biophysics until in the 1980s, and soft metaphysics became a thing, was born. And suddenly, everybody was doing self-assembly in the soft matter field. So this is a um, another paragraph from um, from um, Kluck and Casper. Um, so what they said is the protein subunits and the nucleic acid chain spontaneously come together to form a simple virus particle because that's their lowest, and I should add three, the lowest energy state. 
the best process of service standards. So this is a process of minimizing the free energy, which is a competition between the uh, uh, internal energy U, which is in this case minimized by the units attracting each other, and you have to you know pay an entropic price because they become disordered. The temperature is positive. Okay, so we have minimized energy and we somehow maximize the entropy and the, and the room temperature is this particular stage is the virus self-assembly the unit. So this is the case if the system can explore all configurations, which just now is certainly good in the simulation because the system was undergoing Brownian motion. So this is well known. This was the work of Peter Pusey. So this is a, a colloidal particles that undergo Brownian motion. And when they are dense enough, the, the um, um, uh, volume fraction of colloids increase from right to left in this photograph. And when they are low, yeah, from right to left, when they're dense enough, they self nucleates these crystals. So, as Kluge and Casper said, this is akin to crystallization. This is the simplest kind of self assembling system that you can see in a microscope. If you watch this process, watch this uh, prior process happen in an optical microscope. So, another type of well known soft matter self assembly is surfactants, these um, kind of schizophrenic molecules that are both water loving and water hating. And oil loving self assembled in my cells, cubic phases, hexagonal phases, lamella. This is the slippery stuff in the bottom with the soap dish, etc. etc. So there was an explosion of self matter research that goes in the self assembly direction, as I've just said. So this is a, um, a, a, a way to mimic what living cell does, that Casper uh, and Kluge so eloquently said. We're trying to build in the, the instruction of assembling the structure to the components and let Brownian motion do the rest. So the way uh, this kind of <coughs> self-assembly research in soft matter has happened, it goes two ways. The majority of people, having been inspired by biology, now wants to go and mimic biology. In other words, we want to design synthetic building blocks to self-assemble into whatever target structures. Okay, so you know this is now a few years ago. This is a Simulation from Sotino's group in Italy. You know, um, this is really child's play compared to what biology can do. But you know, in a simulation, you can begin to say, supposing I have colloidal particles that only attract each other through these patches. Now chemists can actually synthesize these things in a in laboratory. So by designing where the patches are, if they undergo Brownian motion, then they begin to you can design what's, what what uh, structures they self assemble. For example, by tuning how big the patches. So now this is getting really sophisticated. This is a paper from 2014 from Serrano Serovic, who is um, who's in ESPCI um, um, in Paris, Guni um, Manaharan and uh, Michael Brenner in the States. So what it did was they designed interaction between the molecules. These are computer molecules. Uh, so red and blue are different molecules. They have different kinds of interaction between different pairs. They want them to self-assemble into what they call uh, big band structure. So this, this this kind of looks like um, this is upside down, but this does. This looks like big band in Parliament in London. Uh, so they want to set assemble big band structures. And this interesting graph shows that um, this is a different uh, interaction string. But different you know, interaction strings make different mistakes. So in other words, these are the different kind of mistake structures they can make. You want this one. And so if you design the interaction wrong. This is kind of fairly flat. It does rise towards this one, but probably they're making mistake structures that are quite hard. Okay, but if you get the interaction right, then it becomes more sharply peaked. Okay, and this is the most sharply peaked. Okay, and this is the interaction. And this one, if you put it in the computer, you self assemble into Big Bang. So the point is self assembly, if you want to do complicated things, you have to deal with mistakes. In this kind of statistical physics terms, there are multiple gazillions of free energy minima that the system may fall into. You really want to design it such that the minimum that you want is very sharp or as sharp as possible. OK, so the point about the design, the moment it gets complicated, more complicated than colloidal crystals or tetrahedral units, that you have to minimize possible mistakes by mistake by things that you don't want. If you don't, if you want Big Ben, you don't want a banana. OK. So um, 
Self-assembly research was, as I shown, originally biologically inspired. It came from viral biophysics. And the vast majority of it now in the solid matter community is often biomimetic. But, but the vast majority of soft matter biomimetic <coughs> grant applications and a small fraction of the actual research still aspires to make artificial life. What I mean by that, what I want to do is in the lab synthesize some um, uh, molecules, you know, this are the gender neutral picture. So, uh, synthesize molecules, shake and stir, um, and put it into a pot. And what you want is um, a frog jumps up or a self assembly. The point is, at the moment, you can't buy this on eBay. I mean, this is the holy grail. And, you know, but it hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> at least I haven't checked archive today, but at least unless it's on archive today, I'm reasonably sure this hasn't happened yet. Otherwise, it would have been a Nobel Prize this year. Now, if you ask soft matter scientists or biophysicists, why haven't it got too complicated enough to make a frog yet by self assembly? The standard answer, and people really do believe this, it's just that we haven't got complicated enough yet. You wait, give us another 50 years, we'll make it. But you know, it's a little bit like fusion. We have been trying for a while. So let me give you a bold answer. I'm going to stick my neck right out and give you a bold answer. I would be perfectly happy if I'm proved wrong. I'd be happier if I'm proved right. I would say self-assembly research will never make a frog or indeed other, any other living organism. And the reason for that is very simple, because exactly half the physics is missing. No more, but no less. Half the physics is missing. So the half the physics that is missing is the physics of death. <clears throat> so let me give you a sort of rhapsodic presentation on death. So this is act one, scene two. So the point is, biology does not yet understand the death of organisms. It's beginning to understand a little bit about the death of single cells. So Lynn Margulis, who's one of the most distinguished biologists, um, evolutionary biologists of the last century, right earlier in the early parts of this century, for all the accomplishments of molecular biology, still can't tell a live cat from a dead cat. And that is absolutely true. Not from molecular biology. So in order to think about death, let's think about how complex systems fail. Edison's first light bulb is simple. It has one failure mode. A simple system, it has one relevant degrees of freedom, and that's the filament. Filament gets hot, it evaporates, it breaks. Okay. Nice and easy. Computer, well, that's more complicated. It has many degrees of freedom, it breaks. On the other hand, when my computer breaks, when I sort of say my computer has died, or put it in inverted commas because it hasn't actually died. You know, perfectly hasn't died. It's just given up working. It's just you know broken down or dropped it or something. You know, I mean that is a metaphor, right? So and when Fremont Island, the nuclear plant at Fremont Island, had the meltdown in 1979, it didn't die. It malfunctioned. It didn't die. What I want you to think a little bit about with me is actually what is real biological death. By real death, I mean biological death. What makes the death of a biological organism totally different from the death of my computer or of a, a, a nuclear power plant? I'll give you just a minute to think about it. what is different. Why is this kind of complicated system when they die? They kind of do things differently. I'm not just I mean, I'm not just talking about our emotional reaction to it. Well, that's very complicated, but nevertheless, even without the emotional reaction, there is something fundamentally different. So what is special about this failure mode? So that's the um, last scene of Act 1. Act 2, scene, Act two I have two scenes <coughs> of why we are not frogs. I'm going to give you the answer to that question a little bit later. So I want to explain to you why humans are not actually frogs. And then I want to survey this topic from molecules to the grandest uh, survey of biology. Back to scene one on why we are not frogs. 
So frogs have webbed feet, web, web uh, digits on, 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 on their limbs. We don't. But once upon a time, we did. Because when we were all inside our mother's womb, we had webbed feet and fingers. What happened during embryogenesis, during the process of development, the process of programmed cell death, actually engaged in cellular sculpture, and exactly the right tissue components die. The red bits disappear. Okay, so the involuted bit knows that they have no they have to disappear. And those cells die. And when the genetic control of that process goes wrong, you end up with a genetic disorder where people do get webbed. Because uh, of this process, this process of cells dying is called programmed cell death, PCD. So this process is absolutely essential to embryogenesis, otherwise we would be born frogs. And in an average one of us, it depends on how much you are drinking, but in the, on an average one of us, uh, there are more than 10 to 11 programmed cell death events a day. If it doesn't happen even in the adult, I mean, you're no longer an embryo, but even if it doesn't happen in an adult, you will immediately know it. Before you can get to the doctor, you'll be dead. And the point about cancer is that some, some cancer cells can actually evade the programmed cell death pathways, and that's why tumors, one of the reasons why a tumor can grow uncontrollably. And there's a lot of research in the Institut Curie. Um, if you're doing a break, you can go and find some of the people who are experts on this. So this is a video that shows human cells uh, committing suicide. This one I will play to the end. So this is a cell. This is a neighboring cell. They've been triggered to commit suicide. You see how traumatic it is. Of course, this is speeded up. So this is known as blebbing. These little bits are blebs. The membranes bleb out and the cells basically disappear under your eyes. So I can't remember how long this video plays for, but um, okay. So I, I'm 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 bored. So the process is called apoptosis, and uh, apoptosis is in fact a Scottish affair, not very far from where I'm living in Aberdeen. Actually, Aberdeen is a long way away, um, a long way up north. But anyway, it's discovered by Kerr, Wiley, and Curie. One of them actually was a visiting academic from Australia. The point is that these people are, were, were histologists. And histologists are people who look at tissue sections in microscopes, either for identifying disease or for identifying a crime. But, so this is a from their uh, paper. In those days, they are beautiful hand-drawn drawings, uh, hand drawing skills. So these are cells packed into uh, some sort of, I can't remember the, the parenchymal layer in which organ, it might have been the liver. Um, and this cell, for example, it decides, so one, of, one, of, one of these cells decides to commit suicide, program cell death, which they call apoptosis, uh, and various processes happen, and they fragment, and then uh, it totally disappears, it's an empty void, as you saw just now. But the point is, what is very curious about these, uh, 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 this kind of process is that the debris, the rubbish at the end, if you like, is not inflammatory. It does not cause inflammation of the organ in which it occurs. <laughs> it leaves no scar in the tissue, which is why it remains so long unobserved by histologists. Because when you look at a piece of liver, which has undergone, you know, 10 to the 10 apoptotic events a day, there's no trace because it's not inflammatory, there are no scarring, the cells just grow back normally. When the historians discover this, the embryologists tell them, I thought you knew all the time, because we see it all the time, we need it for embryogenesis. So the, embryo the embryologists did not get the chance to name it, but this is now called apoptosis, because apparently this process looks like you're falling off from a pole. Ptosis is a, is a petal, petal of a flower. So apparently the Greek professor told him that this is like petals falling off a flower. So it's known as apoptosis. Okay, so this 
tear tooth, necrosis, which is, you know, if you just take a knife and stab a living tissue, the debris from that kind of violent cell death, cell murder, are inflammatory. And they will leave scars, as anybody who has barely cut a finger will know. Okay? So they're quite different. Cell murder is quite different from self-voluntary suicide. So Jean-Claude Emerson from the uh, Hôpital Pichet in uh, Paris, he, in 1995, discovered apoptosis in single-cell eukaryotes. And that led loose a storm throughout the whole of biology. So eukaryotes, um, everyone here knows, but I wrote this talk originally for um, physicists who don't know any biology. Uh, eukaryotes are the cells of nuclei and mitochondria. Eukaryotes are the ones that are like bacteria, where the DNA does not have a nuclear membrane. Um, so the point about this storm is that how can a trait that is suicidal have evolved? So I will tell you some clues later. But the really interesting thing is from, um, from uh, 2007, uh, Lindner and Tede and others from the Nikka hospitals and elsewhere, again, so, you know, single cell apoptosis is a sort of Parisian affair, um, just like original apoptosis is a Scottish affair. It's very nice, Scotland, France, the old alliance. Right, we're back on. So, um, so in 2007, Tede and uh, Lindner and others discovered PCD, problem cell death, in bacteria, in prokaryotes. Also controversial, but I think now it is almost accepted. Now, the reason we're telling you that, that, that means, oh, sorry, the point is, in a eukaryote, this is a mitochondrion where the respiratory uh, uh, reactions take place to make energy. The mitochondria is, the, is a major player in initiating program cell death in, in eukaryotes. Not the only way, but one of the major PCD pathways is initiated by the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion started life as a bacterium that was swallowed by a bigger cell, but the bigger cell had, had, had indigestion and it kept it. So if modern day mitochondria can initiate PCD, then it's not wholly surprising that the original bacterium could also do program cell death. So the conclusion to all of that is everybody does it. Everybody from us, perhaps um, you can call us an advanced organism, um, all the way down to single cell eukaryotes and even simpler single cell prokaryotes. One of the clues that we may, why it may have evolved, comes from this currently still controversial paper because they didn't do it very well. Um, but I think there's some truth in it. I have talked to various people who try to replicate it, and you have sort of intriguing results of this kind. So they uh, um, took a bucket of green algae, Clematomonas renhardii, renhardii, they induced program cell death. A bit they didn't do very well, they didn't check for the molecular markers of program cell death. But never mind, suppose you did it, they induced program cell death, spin all the debris down, take the supernatant off and put it into a flask. They sonicate out to sound, that's cell murder. You rip the cells apart, you spin down the debris, take the supernatant and put it into another flask. You grow the same algae in it. And what they find is that this one, this bottle grew better than the original one in the defined media. This is the, this grow, this grew in a medium that is defined by you. This one, Growth is inhibited compared to the fine medium. So it looks like, in this kind of algae anyway, they live in an environment where the cells, when they decide that they need to commit suicide, what they do is altruistic. It benefits the cells that have not died. So you could imagine, it's not a proof, but you could imagine this could be part of starvation response of single cells to enable others in the colonies to survive for longer, but just in case nutrient is just around the corner. So as I said, that's controversial, but there are many labs that are now trying to reproduce that result. And they certainly find it in each case, in each case, although the results may be may differ from that other paper, apoptosis or single cell uh, suicide, which is only known as PCD in prokaryotes, is an evolved trait, not random. Nothing in biology is random. Um, so, by that I mean, apoptosis cell suicide is selected to increase fitness. So, apoptosis 
program surveys in general is a key example of what I called PSD, dissipative sale disassembly. If anyone can be more poetic or um, or uh, less less difficult to say, aim, I would love to know. But at the moment, this is the best I can do. But I run a competition. If you give me a name within two days, that is better. Next time we meet, I'll buy you a drink. But by dissipative, I mean in the biological context, these processes depend on fuel, such as ATP, ETP, or various other kinds of biological fuel. Okay, back to scene two. Let me survey dissipative self disassembly from molecules to ecosystems. So this kind of thing is completely ubiquitous. So in cells, I've talked about already with you, uh, in cells and tissues, is whole cells and whole tissue do it, it's apoptosis. Our molecules go down the scale with protein turnover and error correction. Well, up the scale, I mean, I can give you an entire lecture just on this alone. Uh, you can go to ecosystem where things rot and there's pretty let me survey them. Protein turnover, amino axis, protein synthesis, you build functional pro proteins, not just the chain, but it has to fold. And then there's a process of proteolysis that chop them back up into amino axis. The point about this cycle is that it happens all the time. Of course, the cell has ways to, to eat up the misfolded proteins, but even the well-folded that are still functional, there's still a typical lifetime over which they're made and it then they get chopped up. For example, in yeast, a typical pro protein in budding yeast, uh, the typical protein lives for about just under an hour. In humans, it's about 30 hours, just more than a day. But all the examples that I can find to date where human proteins live about the same as our lives are interestingly implicated in aging. That has a message there already. So there is a species of bacteria like the Bacillus lactis, which is used in foodstuffs. In its rest stage, which one is not doing anything else, it's not escaping enemies, swimming, anything else. And this process can sometimes, under some conditions, consume up to 50% of its energy. In other words, like the Bacillus lactis can spend up to 50% of its energy budget on making, chopping, making, chopping. Now, so this is a symbolic form of that. But what I didn't know until I started thinking about this is in fact, in almost all cases, the beginning of chopping up a protein is ATP dependent. So there's a whole bunch of so-called ATP dependent proteases that needs energy. And what it does is it unwinds the folded structure into a secondary structure to make it a bit more disordered. And then, and then the ATP independent proteases and peptidases can then work on those fragments. This doesn't depend on, a, on ATP. Okay, just this is non dissipative self disassembly back to the amino axis. But this bit is crucial. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about that because I'm running out of time. So the point is, these. The, the only essential protease, the only essential enzyme that chops up proteins in E. coli, it's called FTSH, HFLB, or 1B, other people, is an ATP dependent one. And in fact, it turns out that this protein is highly and widely conserved in the whole of the bacterial eubacteria uh, subkingdom. And in fact, it survives today in all of us in our mitochondria and in plants in the chloroplast. So once this ATP dependent protease has evolved just the one time in evolutionary history, living organisms kept it. It's absolutely essential to have dissipative cell disassembly. Heat shock response. Uh, okay. So heat shock response in E. coli depends on the master regulator sigma 32 as a protein. It's continuously turn over a half life of one minute. The way heat shock works is for heat shock when the cell is shocked by heat. The misfolded proteins, as a result, slightly changes the rate of production of this stuff. Slightly change the half-life. The half-life goes down. So, in fact, no, oh, sorry, this arrow is wrong. With the half-life goes up. Sorry about that. This goes up. Um, and so this stuff accumulates. Sigma 32 accumulates, and then it leads to um, it leads to 
downstream triggering of the whole cascade of heat shock response. But here the turn over, over is really rather fast. But again, this process depends on protein turnover, continuous disassembly. Error correction. You all know this. The natural error rate of DNA replication is 10 to the minus 5. Actual error rate is 2 to 3 orders of magnitude lower. And the reason is uh, the cell doesn't mind making mistakes. It makes mistakes, but it does proofreading. You proofread and find a mistake, it chops it out. And upon about the proofreading bit of this is that it is definitely dissipated. It's definite self disassembly. Okay, you dissipatively read and disassemble the mistakes, followed by reassembly. Okay, so when I say dissipative self disassembly, you know all about it already. And the point is, this is totally different from humans. Okay, so very clever humans, much cleverer than me, design building blocks, very hard work in a computer for it to have interaction to allow them to fall down free energy funnels to self assemble Big Ben. But in biology, Go on, be my guest, make mistakes. I'm just going to dissipate some energy and prove read and correct. Endogenous metabolism. Here I will just show you one result from our group. It turns out that no one has studied this for a long time. There's recently a single paper was from the 60s. But if you give E. coli no back, no nutrient, but just oxygen, it starts di digesting itself. Okay, it starts using its own energy to digest itself to prolong its starvation life. But it's not random. So Dawes and Ribbon did a lot of work in the 60s to sort out using classical biochemistry, no genetics, very clever. <coughs> e. coli digests itself pre -pro in a pre-programmed, in other words, evolved sequence. It didn't dis disassemble bits and pieces at random. So what we have started doing to investigate this in a very gentle way is we take multi E. coli, they swim, we seal it in a capillary, and we measure their swimming speed, the average population speed, because the speed of a swimming cell is proportional to the proton multi force, which is what the cell burns energy to make because the PMF actually does all the other work. So here it is the population average speed against time. These are long experiments. So if I use Vaseline to seal the capillary, oxygen is permeable in Vaseline. The speed continuously decreases. Okay. If I use oil to seal, the, the tube of oil, oxygen is impermeable in this oil. And so when the cells are consumed, all the oxygen it suddenly crashes because this kind of endogenous metabolism takes oxygen to make. And so this is how we decided we are doing endogenous metabolism. So amazingly, every time I do the experiment, this can be fitted with a double exponential, which means that somebody is watching maybe. But uh, interestingly, when my colleagues, uh, uh, Lynn Lowe and, and, and Billy Zotter, uh, Pilizotto is my colleague in Edinburgh. I did this experiment with single cells and measured the rotation frequency of the flagella. They get single exponentials. So, in fact, what our current interpretation of this is that it's probably phenotypic heterogeneity. In other words, each cell has a different single exponential. The population adds up to mimic the double exponential. But it still means that there is a process going on that is not random at all. Or at least if it's random, it's a Poisson process with an extremely well-defined mean. And so, you know, the question is, how does it actually do its self disassembly? What is the physics? Autophagy, I don't have to tell you much about it. There are Nobel Prizes on this. There's a process called autophagy, where a special organelle in the cell enables the cell to eat parts of, its, parts of itself. And it's useful in repair to fight infections, starvation response, and again, it's dissipative. Now let's jump all the way up to an ecosystem. Ecosystem thrives on predation. And I would like you to look at uh, hunting in a different way. Hunting is there, I mean, if you consider the entire ecosystem, a single organism, then uh, hunting is just the ecosystem. So we're doing dissipative self disassembly. This dissipates some energy. This is just dissipates some energy to get the privilege of disassembling this, to feed these. Okay. So in the ecosystem, DSP is for recycling. Exact same as in a forest, in a, in a floor of rainforest, you know what the fungi does. What the fungi does is, is the recycling engines. The fungi use, use their living energy to disassemble bits of the forest, bring in the nutrient for the forest to grow again and for itself. So again, if you consider the whole forest and ecosystem, the fungi in the bottom of the forest floor is the main organ for dissipative cell disassembly of the forest ecosystem. 
So that's how you get the nutrient cycle. This, you've seen this kind of pictures many times, but what it didn't tell you is that this is in fact a process of dissipative self disassembly. So let's take stock. Uh, tell me how I'm doing. When do you want me to finish? How am I doing? Can someone tell me how many minutes do you want me to go on for? Hello? Tell me how many minutes I've got. Yeah, maybe if you can, if you, if you can have another, another 20 minutes. I may just be able to do that. Thank you very much. I'll do my best. Thanks. Okay. So, next off, I've shown you dissipative self disassembly. Actually, happens on all in scales, some of which you already know about. Molecules, protein turnover, cells and tissues, program cell death, and cycle and ecosystems. And, in fact, this is a picture from an econometrics paper modeling the so-called circular economy. So I'll come back to that. But the point is, this hasn't happened yet. This hasn't happened yet. Because I think this kind of just doing self-assembly, however complicated, I'm going to stick my neck right out. It will never succeed. It will never succeed unless we learn to build in dissipative cell disassembly. We want to mimic biology, we have to mimic all of it not precisely half of it. This half is called self-assembly, dissipated or not. The other half is called self-disassembly, and a lot of it is dissipated. I stick my neck right out. If I'm wrong in 20 years, well, I'd be very happy because I mean someone has managed to do this, and they will get a lower price. Now, why am I showing you this again? I forgot. Uh, oh, yeah. And the reason why biological death is special, I promise I'll get back to that question, the reason why biological death is special is not revealed. Because biological death on all levels is a process of uh, dissipative self disassembly driven recycling. When things die, they die in a perfect way for the other cells in a non inflammatory kind of way to absorb the nutrients and recycle. It evolved to feed the other cells. The florist floor. Fungi, DSD driven in the fungi is evolved, has evolved together with the rest of the ecosystem, feed itself and the rest of the ecosystem. So I would claim that biological biology only happens when it gets complicated enough for the death of organism, for the failure mode to be able to do this as a matter of course. So if I'm right, if I'm right, this self disassembly is absolute crucial life, however early a form of life. Because this is an evolved trait. Evolution is crucial to life. So if that if there's anything in that at all, can this can this sort of paradigm, can this kind of point of view generate any research? I mean it's only become useful if you generate some research. You know, is before self-assembly, people have been doing biology. After self-assembly, people are still doing biology. But if you talk about it as self-assembly, it attracts the attention of a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of soft matter physicists who are interested in the self-assembly process, the test tube. What I'm hoping is that if a large community of physicists start thinking carefully about uh, dissipative self-disassembly, it would in a very fruitful way interact with biology again, because it allows you to see certain biological processes, not as individuals, but as members of larger classes. So, I think the biggest research paradigm is to understand the design principles. What sort of grand reasons, what, what super reasons can be for different kinds of dissipative service assembly? So let's look at individual cases to do some general principles. So what's the principle for continuous turnover? So, you know, sigma 32, again, this is wrong, this should be up. Um, so sigma 32 is turnover. The cell needs energy to turn over sigma 32 in a minute. I mean, this sounds silly. It obviously too clever to have been designed by physicists because, you know, you just turn things over. You make them, you use energy to take them apart, you make them, you turn into car. Seems wasteful. But my hunch, my hunch is that if you maintain it using this, maintain some concentration and only tune this rate by a tiny bit, you make it very sensitive. So I suspect it's a sensitivity thing. It's a little bit like a transistor uh, M M R circuit for you who know these things. You know, you bias this transistor to half VCC just so that you don't clip the input signal. But this this process is wasteful. 
because they're transistors. It's kept warm all the time. So I think that in fact, um, reason for, for that, their turnover is actually for speed of response. So I bet you, if you look hard enough, there will be plenty of examples where biology uses energy to disassemble and then reassemble to give a faster response because tuning their cycle is uh, quicker than synthesizing de novo. Okay. Now, the protein disassembly is necessarily ATP dependent. Well, my analogy of that, you know this child lock on top of the pill bottle that you get from the pharmacist. Why do you need a child bottle? Well, because, you know, if you can screw it on easily, you can unscrew it just as easily. So my analogy is when you fold a protein, the last step is the <laughs> The last step clicks into the tertiary structure, and that's the step that gives energy to unwind. You need to do some work to unwind the protein to make it not too easy to unfold, and that's the bit that, that has to unfold it. It needs ATP. Then the rest, once you've done the run, undone the sort of initial click bit, then you can actually let it do, do it by itself. So another reason for dissipative self assembly may well be because structures have to be just stable enough, there has to be a little bit of a child lock in it, and you can unfold it. So in each, in each case, I'm giving you one example and say, let's look for more examples to see whether that principle is general. Why DSD is so, so ubiquitous in biology. So it turns out that you can trace dissipative self disassembly genes all the way back. I mean, no one has traced it back to Luca. It turns out that very similar genes are in all of these kingdoms. But that again tells you that the process may be generic and that there must be some generic reasons, such as, you know, error correction, such as speed of response, such as uh, the, the um, child lock thing that I took. So that's what I just said. I think there are design principles. Uh, cells use DSD for generic reasons. So, you know, so I've got a simulator, but here's a sort of simulation experiment that one could imagine doing. I'm going to talk about Shakespeare, but you can just easily do it with proteum. So here's Shakespeare. You know, there's a whole lot of statistics about Shakespeare, about his plays. So supposing, supposing I give you the play Hamlet. Uh, it's, it's Shakespeare's longest play. There's a reason for that. I'll tell you. Um, I'll give you Shakespeare's longest play. And I challenge you to do this. So this is the this is um, the play out of which this quotation came. So in uh, in uh, Macbeth, this is where this quotation comes from. So I challenge you to cut this up. You can cut it up into acts and scenes and paragraphs and sentences and words and individual letters. And I want you to use the cut up soup to get a monkey to type on the keyboard oh, yeah, at random, reassemble like that. So that's the challenge. Cut this up into any kind of soup you like and get a monkey, reassemble it. And what I want to optimize is that every cut you make, if you cut it into two X, plus one unit of few, you cut this. So, so but, but okay, so you use few. Every cut you make, every cut of the scissors takes one unit of few. And I want the monkey to be able to assemble Macbeth in the quickest possible time. I, I want the bits to be as usable, usable as possible. I want the lowest few and the fastest time. What is the optimal strategy? Well, you know, of course, you need to know something about Shakespeare's plays. The like ideas of the background laws of physics and chemistry. Protect to be or not to be. You can cut it up into words. You can cut it up into letters, for example. And in this case, if you know that Shakespeare's plays are all written in English, you will not be as foolish as using your field to cut it up this sentence into letters. You'll cut it up into words. Because you're absolutely sure that two will occur in, in uh, Macbeth, B will occur in Macbeth, O will occur in Macbeth, and not occur in Macbeth. Um, on the other hand, you will cut up the word Hamlet into letters. Because you can bet for sure, if you haven't read it, that the word Hamlet does not occur in the play Macbeth. Okay, so you know if you know something about your targets, the laws of English and all the rest of it, you can design the optimal strategy. 
but you can do this with a proteome. Take um, a long protein, cut up the bits. How many, you know, what's the optimal way to cut it up to make a shorter protein? Okay. Okay, so I said all that. I've got. Okay, so you know, it's a whole bunch of simulation type things that one could do to begin to try to understand. And I did start a project for Serrano Serotic in the USPCI and Don Franco in Cambridge, but COVID put a put a stop to that. So we, we meet again to start doing some simulations of whether there are some general principles we can use. But my claim, my claim is a bold claim, that if we manage to embed self disassembly and selection to soft matter science of self assembly, then it would in fact transform soft matter science fundamentally. Because we're missing half the tricks. Self assembly has been incredibly fruitful or since 1980 or thereabouts. But we're missing half the tricks. I'd use about hooking self assembly to self disassembly, especially of the disassembly. But it will also lead, again, it's a bold claim, but it leads to a new understanding of the physics of life because it'll give you some general principles, just like self assembly has given up some new general principles. I think it will lead to novel statistical mechanics from the start. He's hugely on deliberate that dissipated. Um, it would lead to novel synthetic chemistry. But can we make things that are dissipatively disassembling things, which is a few other than ATP? Okay. Well, everybody, I know we're trying to do experiments on this, borrow from biology and use ATP to machinery. Can we synthesize machinery to disassemble soft matter? Up, up, etc. By inside the non logical origin. Okay. And next, I think things, especially during the week of COP26, I think will impact us to move on the circular economy. So let me just finish on this act in three circular economy, recycling, and disassembly. So the current linear model of the economy says we make something, we use something, we get rid of it. Circular economy, we make something, we use something, and we recycle it. So, you know, my computer, my computer died in a metaphorical way. But the question is, you know, how do you recycle it into a new computer? Uh, you know, if it is biology, it is biology, you can just bury it in soil, and next year you find components are growing out on the tree. Okay. It's not biology. So, the way we can do this. You need to think about it. Not all ways of doing it are equally appropriate. Of course, you can smash it. You can smash it. Maybe very satisfying. I mean, I'm sure many of us, especially in the era of Zoom, have wanted to do this to our computer multiple times per month. You can smash it, but that's not the appropriate way to recycle. If you really want to recycle, what you want to do is to take it down to its components. You don't want to smash it too much. But in order to do that, you want to build in recyclability. So at least a while ago, it's no longer true, a while ago, this envelope is very difficult to recycle because the paper and the plastic have to be disentangled before you can recycle the paper and the plastic. So the point is, you have to design in easy recyclability from the beginning. There's no point telling yourself, I should have done it differently because you already made a million of these. So engineers are now taught this. They are now taught how to do design with final recycling in mind. Okay. So amazingly, Nokia has made in 2001 a phone that can do cell trigger disassembly. If you heat that phone up to, I think, about 130 degrees, which fortunately is hotter than most people in the pocket, they never marketed that version. It actually then self disassembled in the printer circuit board, the LCD display, the cover, the battery. Um, they never bought the paper, but they had a press release. Annoyingly, engineers now call this process active self disassembly, so they nicked my name. Unfortunately, they have not patented that. Never mind. But I think this is not particularly active, although you do have to heat it up, but it's less active than the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So this is more appropriate kind of recycling because you may well be able to use these as big bits. So, you know, unfortunately, Nokia has not discovered how to do uh, dissipative or otherwise self-assembly of these components into a new model of the uh, phone. But never mind, uh, still at a time. So I'm going to finish with a slide I already showed you before. 
This is a paper I found from a um, um, sustainability science journal where they try to write down a, a mathematical model for the total circular, total circular economy that includes, crucially, resources, which includes energy. It's an entirely closed system now, apart from input from sunlight. I wouldn't mind betting again that once we actually write down the theoretical physics of dissipative self-disassembly and coupling to self-assembly, the kind of models that we have to make is not going to be dramatically unlike the sort of model that we need to do uh, economics of the circular economy. So at, at that, I will finish. I think I'm still five minutes earlier than you want me to finish. So there you go. Thanks for listening. cells that uh, um, subsequent to uh, this spontaneous suicide, then other cells of the same species grow better um, in, in the same uh, medium. You said that it was not done very well, but uh, and then uh, we also see that in, in uh, multicellular organisms, um, as, as you talked about. So do you think this, this property of, uh, of death in order to um, promote life was simply, could, could it be just carried on from pro prokaryotes to, to multicellular uh, organisms? That's an extremely interesting question. Let me say two things. One is that example that I gave was not prokaryotes. Uh, the algae are already single cell eukaryotes. I don't think that trait has ever been shown in prokaryotes yet. Maybe. The second thing is when, uh, colleagues of mine trying to replicate the experiments, they find that whether, I mean, it's very, very preliminary, but it, 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 it appears that whether the uh, supernatant from program cell death inhibits or promotes depends on conditions. So just imagine this, I'm not going to approve by any chance, but imagine you can tell both narratives. If a colony of single cell organisms are starving, under some conditions, it may be advantageous for the cells to commit suicide, some of them to commit suicide, to give nutrients to the remaining cells uh, to enable them to wait longer to see the nutrients arrive. But under other conditions, um, it may be advantageous for the cell to inhibit the growth of the other cells so that they actually slow their metabolism right down, not kill, but inhibit, to wait for a better day for nutrients to arrive. So whether they want the cells to promote the growth of the other cells, to enable them to keep metabolizing for a better day, or if the nutrient starvation is typically long term, it may help for the cells to commit suicide and, 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 and release substances that uh, inhibit the growth of the other cells, not kill, inhibit, so they go into low metabolic state and help them survive. So I think I believe the emerging evidence will show that whether it inhibits or, 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 or promotes depends on the ecological system. And that is as it should be. Everything in biology has evolved to live in ecosystems. Does that uh, begin to answer your question? Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I was wondering because, uh, you know, I guess today it's, it's pretty much accepted that uh, Organelles were were basically engulfed by uh, early eukaryotes. So I just maybe maybe this property was simply carried on um, from those early uh, primitive cells to to, to multicellular organisms. This was what maybe I'm, I misunderstood, but it was just kind of my question. Do you think it's, it's possible? Well, yes, because my, my I mean I. The, one of the slides that my, my tech writer I didn't show is that I believe that the least uh, 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 the, the Duke, what we call, uh, common ancestors, the last common ancestor already has the 
ability to commit suicide. I, I actually think that programmed death must have evolved with the earliest life because I can't see how I can do it any otherwise. It's more uh, common. Uh, first, uh, your talk was really uh, very fascinating because the subject of death is, is uh, of course, central to the issue of, uh, of uh, life. Uh, something you, you did not uh, mention was the connection with the origin of life, which is quite obvious. I, I would like to make some comments which maybe will be of interest uh, for you. First, that cell death was discovered by Anthony von Lievenhoek in 1696. Programmed cell death, uh, cell death was discovered by German bacteriologists uh, Ferdinand Kohn and uh, Robert Koch in the 19th century. And uh, well, you made you made statements about ubiquity, and it's very difficult to generalize. But I would like to stress the fact that. Uh, we are all connected to the last universal common ancestor by uh, cells, none of which died. So cell death, for instance, is clearly necessary as a possibility, but it's not universal in living systems. And I think the same uh, conclusion applies to what you call DSD. Well, I mean, let me just give you a quick response. Cell death is certainly necessary. The, the argument is whether programmed cell death is necessary. And at the moment, my conviction is that it differs from you, but you know, I don't think at the moment either of us can prove that we are correct. Because we haven't got Luca yet. But thank you for the uh, reference to Leeuwenhoek. I didn't know that he discovered cell death. I don't know whether he discovered programmed cell death. Okay, another question. Yes, there is one here. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I wonder, sort of following on, uh, I think, on, on the questions that have been asked so far, if you can comment at all on sort of the usefulness of this mental model at different scales. Um, it strikes me that it is one thing to talk about, uh, you know, cells inside of an individual, and um, it's quite the jump to move to a full ecosystem and calling predation a sort of move, uh, a kind of this. I can see the connection, um, but uh, I wonder if you think there is a sort of, um, uh, if it truly is one mental model that you can have all the way from single cells all the way up into the universe, or if, uh, you know, there was sort of a matter of degrees somewhere in there. Is that clear? Yes, it's totally clear. I, I get asked that question at least once after every talk. So thank you for asking it. Um, look, self-assembly was also once a very vague, nebulous, general, probably too grand concept. But as we learn to do research on it, it becomes slightly more specific. And, you know, we are used to saying biology is all self-assembly. Of course, in that form, it's totally useless. But I think the way of thinking, that way of looking at it, self-evidently has been incredibly fruitful in the last you know, 50 years on all, on all levels. And then think about this sort of the most theoretical mathematical modeling level. Can I really believe that when you eventually write the equations down, there won't be any systems level similarities? That's number one. Number two, the reason why I think it is useful to think about it on all length scales is that um, I lost the picture, but never mind. The reason why it's useful to think about all length scales is that I think you might find that there's some, the same reasons may be present on every length scale to do dissipative self disassembly. Okay, so, you know, it may be that at a lot of levels, if not at all levels, correcting mistakes is one of them or speed of response is, is, is another. So I just wonder whether, it, and, and that's exactly the way self-assembly research has happened. 
you know, some general principles of justice applicable to robots, self-assembling things as to um, colloids assembling things. So at the moment, at the beginning of a big idea, if indeed that is what it is, it's bound to be vague. It was self-assembly was very vague in the hands of uh, Kluge and Casper, but it became specific and useful as people start doing things under that umbrella. So that, that's my current response. Okay, I see no more questions. Maybe it's related, but how, how do you relate that to uh, aging of, of, you know, organisms altogether? What is the relationship? What relationship do you see between them? Right. So I, I self-consciously have not read that literature, but I'm aware that the senility literature is related to the death literature, and I'm still to read it. The only thing that I want to point out is the the one fact that I discovered in the literature, which is all the human proteins that I can find that have basically the same lifetime as us, that would they last a lifetime. In other words, they are not dissipated self to the sample by the system itself. They are all implicated in aging. So that's that's my one kind of link. But I, I agree they're hugely linked, but I don't have time to read up on, on, on senility yet. Okay, yeah. Because, yeah, right, the strategy of waste management, as you describe it, uh, it I mean, it's not perfect over the years, so... So you, you no. expect, right. Right. I mean, it, it, and indeed, it, it's, it's, a, it's the lack of that sort of balance between self-assembly and self-disassembly that you can see it as aging, it's the inevitable process of that. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I absolutely would like to have some time to um, think about that, that perspective. I haven't done it yet. Next time. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, Wilson, we thank you again very much. For well, thank you for us. letting me do this. Yeah. And we hope to see you soon in, in Paris in person. That would be nice. Let's get over.